start by saying that we're holding this event in honor of the late Sheila McHugh, whose mother Jean McHugh and friends are here. Can you, where are you, Jean McHugh? Will you raise your hand and, and friends? Thank you very, very much for sponsoring this series of events here at the school to bring speakers like Geneva here to talk to us. We really, really appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Geneva is currently the Curtis B. Hurley Chair in Public Affairs reporting at the Journalism School at the University of Missouri. And um, she has a long and illustrious resume, but the part of it, students, that is the most important, the part that makes her worthwhile being heard, is that she covered City Hall and the State Legislature for the Colorado Springs Sun. Okay? That's where she started. I don't care what she did after that. It doesn't. Right. But it doesn't matter that she then spent some years in Africa and Europe freelancing. It doesn't matter that she was an editorial writer at the New York Times or the Des Moines Register, that she's a columnist for the Post, an ombudsman for the Post. It doesn't matter any of that, that beginning as a legislative reporter. You can tell she's a political. Okay, that, that's all the cred she needs. Anyway, what she's come here tonight to talk to us about is um, a manifesto for change. I think of it as a sort of hallelujah, there's maybe light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know if there really, I don't know if there really is, but uh, it's the first, at don't least. Know if there really is. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know if I believe you, but it's at the first, <laughs> the first attempt by anybody to say, all right, let's quit tearing our hair out and, and start doing something about it. So um, we asked Geneva if she'd talk for about 15 minutes, and then we will open up the floor to the rest of us and, and see what we can find out. So however you want to proceed, Geneva. Thank you, Susan. I've had a lot of introductions, and, and I don't know if I've ever had one that said, well, I don't know if I believe you, but <laughs> <laughs> I like honesty. Um, it's great to be here. I've been to Berkeley before, but I have never been to the journalism school, which, you know, Marcia and I were talking about this after... I've been in the biz almost 40 years, and I've you know, been a newspaper editor, et cetera, et cetera. I have never been to this fine journalism school, and it's really an honor for me to be here. And I do want to thank the McHugh family and friends for, for, for putting this together. It's, uh, I've been sort of circumventing the bay in the past few days. I'm taking my, somebody said, are you on a book tour? And I said, yeah, I'm on a book tour. I just, it's, it's not about a book. It's about this manifesto, modestly named manifesto, on behalf of the future of journalism, which I wrote after my 35 years plus in the biz, because frankly, I was tired of the lament. I was tired of, you know, oh, woe is us about this, and woe is us about that. I spent almost seven years, is this working the mic, is that fine? I spent almost seven years as editor of the Des Moines Register, which was, was a once great newspaper, and I felt just about every day that I was presiding over the diminishment of a great newspaper. And that, you know, it hurts to do that. So I have done a variety of things in my life to try to think about what we can do. And at the end of my tenure as editor of the Register, I went to a, a newspaper analyst, many of you will know the name, John Morton, who's still writing in AJR, I think. And I said, John, you know, there must be ways we could reach the shareholders, you know, for whom this, these, Burdens and profits are being produced, and we could say, but the social capital of journalism, you know? And he stopped me, and he all but patted me on the head, and he said, Geneva, these are pension funds. <laughs> it was one of those educations, you know? It was one of those moments where you think, okay, I'm going to go do other things. And that's sort of the kind of uh, experience that, for me, culminated in my writing this, this manifesto. Now, I've, as I said, been going circumventing the Bay, and I, I spoke at, in San Jose to a community group whose, whose concerns are sort of one set of things. And I also spoke at the Mercury News, newspaper staff, a different kind of concern. These two different concerns are very important here, because on the one hand, we have a community worried about, you know, so what's happening to our journalism at San Jose Mercury News, as you all, many of you know, has been sold. Um, very questionable what's going to happen in its future. So what's happening to our journalism? That's one important question. What's happening to the journalism? The question that journalists tend to have is, what's happening to my job? What's happening to my newspaper? 
I spoke in, at Stanford with a group of faculty members, interesting people who are trying to think about the change uh, that's going on in the journalism world, and with the Knight Fellows there and with others. And then today I went to Cron U, the San Francisco Chronicle, as some of you no doubt know, has this you know, brown bag with staff. And of course, they, again, I was, Susan Faludi is writing a book about women's voices after 9-11, and she interviewed me at the Cron afterwards, so I invited her to come to this brown bag. And she said to me afterward, it was like being in a 12-step group. <laughs> People were trying to figure out, you know, how do I get to a better future? <laughs> and it really does feel that way. I mean, our business, the journalism craft, is in enormous change right now. And um, reminded me um, how much people care about this and the different views about this. I got on a train in Palo Alto. I got on the Caltrain to go to Millbury to change to BART to go into the city. And in Redwood City, the train stopped. And a woman got on and said, do you know what the delay has been about? Well, the delay was that there was a bomb scare on the southbound Caltrain track in Palo Alto. It was fine. I mean, by the time I got to the station, it had been resolved. There were cops all over the place. But, you know, it had been resolved. But in the meantime, of course, the trains were running both north and south on one track, and so the trains were delayed. So I explained to the woman there had been this bomb scare in Palo Alto. And she said, oh, and she said the sort of things we expect about the times today, you know, all these times we're living in. And then she said, you know, I said to my husband just the other day, the paper, and I later asked her, she was talking about the Mercury News, the paper has been so thin lately. And she said, you know, I know that's good news that the paper is so thin. <laughs> it means that there isn't much bad news. <laughs> well, I know Frank Vega from the old Gannett days. And he asked me, he's the publisher now at the Cron. He asked me to come in and say hello. And I told him this story. And he said, oh, we got to use that one. <laughs> But as you all know in this room, it is not because there is much bad news, not much bad news, that newspapers are as thin as they are. I really do, I, I say in this manifesto that journalism as we know it is over, and, and I really believe that. And what do I mean by that? I mean, journalism as we have known it, practiced as we have known it, is over because the economic model has collapsed. And it really has. I mean, it, we've reached a tipping point. We've been predicting forever that all the classifieds will go online. And, but all of a sudden, it really has happened. And people who bought Knight Ritter, the McClatchy newspapers who bought Knight Ritter, you know, all of a sudden, right after that, the Brian Tierney and company who bought the Philadelphia Inquirer, right after that. So what do we see? McClatchy sells the Star Tribune eight years in Minneapolis, the Star Tribune in Minneapolis, eight years after it bought it for a billion dollars plus. It sells it for 500 million and change. Brian Tierney thinks, oh my god, what do I do here with the Philadelphia Inquirer? I gotta cut staff. The Boston Globe lost money last quarter. I mean, we are now in an environment where the old lament about if only we could ask these CEOs to somehow figure out a way to work with Wall Street to produce less profits. I mean, that is yesterday's problem. John Carroll, a distinguished and terrific guy who used to be LA uh, executive editor at the LA Times, was saying in Harvard a couple of weeks ago at the Shorenstein Center 20th anniversary, this is a center on media studies at Harvard, he said, you know, if, I'd been, if only when I was at the LA Times we had been able to make a $20, $20 million net income before trial. I'm sorry, we were making $20 million net income before taxes. If only we'd been able to make $10 million. I could have spent, you know, 12 here, and blah, blah, blah. My husband, who was also in the biz, when I came home and told him the story, said, wait six months, you'll be making 10 million, and you won't have it to spend on the newsroom. So the economic model has collapsed, and I'm talking about newspapers here, and I don't mean to exclude other important media, but I think even many of my broadcast and magazine brethren would, under, would, would accept that newspapers have been the real engine of community news. When I became editor of the Des Moines Register, I kind of traveled around the state in one of these little planes. And everywhere I went, newsrooms across the country, I mean across the state, whether they were newspaper or radio or television, they had a copy of the Register on their news desk. And similarly, people have a copy of the New York Times on their news desk across the country. So newspapers really have been engines of providing information. And while I would never make the argument that somehow 
journalism has been so unassailably great that we shouldn't change it. On the contrary, I have been the private ombudsman of the Washington Post, and I'm the first to criticize, maybe not the first, but right there in the vanguard on criticizing journalism. I think it's been too top down. Whole wide swaths of community have been left out. It failed us in the run up to the war. It gets rutted in conventional thinking. But it has told us an awful lot. And it has been, I think, a force for good overwhelmingly in our society. And if we don't have it, journalism as we had known it, then, then what replaces it? Now the good news is there's an awful lot going on on the web that is great. And I think we underattend that. We journalists, you know, we've got people who are doing, you've got examples like the librarian in Deerfield, New Hampshire, who is thinking, why is no one covering our community? People run for office and nobody interviews them. We don't have any idea who the candidates are. How the hell do we vote intelligently? Well, they start up an online newspaper, and they want it to be a newspaper. They're not trying to do some razzle-dazzle new media thing. They want a newspaper, and it does all the traditional newspaper things. And a couple of years later, it's got 72 contributors and all over the community people are, you know, and it's publishing an actual print newspaper once a week. And the last time I talked to anyone who knew anything about it, they said the Concord, New Hampshire Monitor has decided to cover Deerfield. So, I mean, that's a great thing. It's sort of going out in concentric circles. You've got in the Minneapolis area the Twin Cities Daily Planet. They aggregate information from ethnic communities, from neighborhoods across the Twin Cities, and they're giving voice to people who have not had voice in mainstream media. That's a great thing. You've got Global Voices um, online, which is an aggregation of bloggers from all over the world. You know, people love to either like or not like bloggers. I mean, bloggers are like anything else. There are bloggers who are journalists and bloggers who are not trying to be journalists. There are terrific and intelligent and smart bloggers and fools who are blogging. It's sort of like the internet. I, Marvin Kalb, whom I like enormously, but I was at a panel where he, he turned to somebody and he said, yes, but do you believe what you read on the net? And somebody said, Marvin, that's like asking, do you believe what you hear on the phone? <laughs> it's a transmission vehicle, you know? And bloggers, it's a similar thing. But this agglomeration of bloggers from all over the world, they're telling us a lot that we wouldn't know otherwise. So some great things are happening on the web. And the main thing that I want to say about that is there are a lot of people who think that disruptive innovation, you know, business school folks will tell us that disruptive innovation is going to mean that it isn't going to be newspapers who create new forms of delivery that work economically. Because old forms simply can't change. And Lord knows, newspaper companies have not been deft or nimble. They've been change averse and really very conservative. So maybe they're right, but I hate inevitability. And I like to believe that newspapers might change. I like to believe they are changing quickly enough to make a difference. But many believe that, you know, these new flowers will all bloom up underneath and sort of supplant them and take over. And if that happens, then lots of great things will no doubt follow. But there are some real questions I think we need to face, like the fact that we have big government. I mean, I'm from Washington, D.C., and I'm telling you, the idea of all these lovely flowers, you know, rising up under big media leaves me wondering who's going to be big enough to go up against big government? or big business. So I think, I think it's a very interesting time. It's a landscape full of possibility. I've probably given you remarks here which make you think this is your optimistic thing. <laughs> I went to the Star Tribune newsroom about a year ago and said, you know, I'm feeling hopeful and everything. And at the end of a few questions, one guy raised his hand and said, what did you feel like before you were hopeful? <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, this is hopeful compared to how I used to be. So. That's my opening remarks, and I look forward to speaking with you, Susan. I'm All right. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so okay. succinct. Maybe we should start with your sort of propositions. Uh, we have copies um, back there of the manifesto, but there are a list of, I guess there are 10 here or thereabouts, of, yeah. of the sort of things you assert that we need to be doing or getting to be doing. Yeah. to have some impact on what the change is. Maybe we go through what those are. The first thing you say is a greater role for nonprofits in the business model, and you're, you talk about NPR, although it strikes me that 
part of what NPR's recent success has been is a very nice bequest from the mm-hmm. Kroc uh, family fortune. That's true. Um, and the St. Petersburg Times is another example of news organizations that mm-hmm. have done well as nonprofits. Can you talk more specifically about yeah. how you see developing the nonprofit model? I mean, in I Philadelphia, think- in San Jose, in mm-hmm. Sacramento. I do think the nonprofits are going to be increasingly important to us as we get a sort of a diversified ownership scene. You know, NPR was doing very well before Mrs. Kroc was so um, benevolent. So um, I think it is a good model. Um, so is the St. Pete Times. The Knight Foundation, which is, is supporting the good work that you all are de- doing here, along with the Carnegie Foundation, is another way to think about it. foundations that support aspects of our work. I was talking to Barton Gregorian, the head of the Carnegie Corporation, about my manifesto the other day, and he said, you know, we, we ought to have endowed investigative reporter positions, the way we have endowed chairs. And that's a very interesting idea. We have people who are essentially endowing investigative reporting. I'm on the board of something called the Center for Public Integrity. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's in Washington. It does independent investigative reporting of the sort that too few news organizations are doing anymore. It's expensive stuff. I mean, this, of course, is key, right, that what we're talking about is the expensive production of original material. This is why the whole economic underpinning is so important. A lot of people on the web are just sort of chewing over somebody else's original material. It costs a lot to produce this stuff, and yet the web wants information to be free, or is it that information wants to be free? So we've got a real problem here. Well, the Center for Public Integrity is funded by foundations. They produce this work, and good old MSM media, too few of them are doing this kind of work anymore, can use it. Of course, foundations are not. I was talking about this to somebody the other day who runs a nonprofit, and they're going, you know, that can't be the panacea because everybody, and this is true, I feel like my knuckles are raw from being at board meetings of foundation, of, of nonprofits that are trying to continue to stay alive. But I do think it'll be an important element of it. So that, yeah, that's one of my, one of my nine. Or, oh, there's nine. There's I think nine, it's nine. nine. nine not ten. Let me just ask you about two more and then open it up to, to everybody here. Um, in one of them, you say, our society would be better served if journalists could make their voices heard more effectively in response to freedom of information challenges, reporters threatened with being jailed. Um, and concerted efforts at misrepresentation of the press and so forth. How would you envision us doing that? Well, I'm happy to say, I'm going to stand up because I can't see all of you, that what, this is happening more than it used to by far in Washington. Um, we have sunshine and in government initiatives now where people are very effectively arguing the case of freedom of the press on the Hill. You know, we have been schooled. I don't know if you'd agree with this, Susan, but I bet you would, and a lot of us in the room. We journalists are sort of schooled that our work speaks for itself. And one of the many verboten things is lobbying. Don't talk about lobbying. You know, we don't do lobbying. But in fact, uh, we and our interests have done lobbying. You know, we wouldn't have sunshine laws in states across the country. And um, now we are endeavoring to represent the interests of the free press in arguing on behalf of the shield law, in trying to strengthen the Freedom of Information Act. And we need to do more of that. But for too long, we just had this view. You know, we don't, our work for, speaks for itself, and we don't speak out on behalf of it. But a lot of people are speaking out against it. As, as individual journalists? I think even that we ought to think about. In our work, we should think about the fact that if we're doing a story that is based on a FOIA, a, a Freedom of Information Act filing, we ought to be sure we say it in the story so that people <coughs> understand that we've gotten this information in the public interest. Because our, our work demands that, I think we ought to speak out. Rosie, Robert Rosenthal, who's the managing editor at The Crown, said he was at a breakfast meeting recently, um, this morning, he said, talking about these issues. I'm glad. I mean, think of all the people who lob insults at us from the left and the right and, you know, politicians who'd rather blame the messenger. Lots of people are decrying the press, and I think we need to speak out on its behalf. So that's what I mean by that one. All right, and then a a final one here. You say, more responsible corporate governance among media companies is essential if the costly work of original journalism is to be sustained. Mm -hmm. Um, Amen, and motherhood is good too. Right. But how how would you imagine we do that? Well, this is the one I first thought was the most important and most interesting, so I spent a lot of time on it. And the truth is, 
that I would argue that it's now among the least important because they are, many of these companies are struggling to stay alive. It just shows how quickly it's going. I, I finished writing this in June last year, and I really did think it was among the most important. And I have a lot of, I have a lot of specifics in here I think we ought to have, and I've been trying these for a while. We ought to have among board members at these media companies journalists, former journalists who really can speak out on behalf of journalism. We ought to have committees, you know, we have audit committees that look at the financial health of the organizations. We ought to have journalism committees that look at the journalistic health of the organizations. I mean, there are a lot of things we can do, and I think there's some great ideas in here, and frankly, I don't think they matter a whole lot anymore at most of these companies, because, again, it's like the John Carroll thing. Everywhere I go, I have journalists say to me, but you need to get executives at the table. What would we say to these executives now? They really are struggling to figure out what the model is when all the eyeballs and advertisers are moved into the web. And it, I mean, advertisers pay 80% of the freight at newspapers, which isn't necessarily a good thing because, you know, you think you're paying for the paper. People used to call me when I was editing the paper, well, I'm paying for this newspaper. And I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're not. And advertisers' preferences speak. And right now, what they're preferring, you know, is moving to the web. Although, I don't mean that newspapers aren't still profitable. Many of them really are. But I mean, in some ways, I, as I say, I think this one matters less than I used to. All right. So. Let us open up among the lady here right. in front. Could you comment a bit on the I, Lewis Libby uh, court proceedings? Oh, <laughs> boy. <laughs> that is so oh, it's so good. It's so good. Don't you it's wish so you were back delicious. covering Congress yes, now, yes, Susan? Yes. <laughs> Well, gee, it's fascinating. I mean, I thought it was so, I have to tell you, first of all, that I've been on the road since Tuesday, and I have been seeing, I'm supposed to do a radio interview here tomorrow, and it's all about what do I think of various specific media coverage of the, this trial, and of the various presidential announcements, and of the State of the Union speech, and I have consumed less media in this week than at any week since I was, I was one, I think. So, you know, USA Today, this USA Today came to my door, and... I, what I think is that the, the testimony I read about by, Gren, do we say Grenier or Grenier, the um, uh, former CIA guy, was absolutely fascinating. And that if his, he suddenly is right in remembering that he told Libby what he told him, then, I mean, what a fascinating thing. This is going to be one, one of the most interesting trials we've seen. And yet, still, I worry a great deal about hauling journalists in here to sort of aid the government in finding out what's going on. Well, and, and, to, and to what end, since the, the charge here is that Libby failed to, you know, disclose certain things, but that the actual leak is, is not the subject of any charge. This has been one of the most convoluted tales in Washington from beginning to end, hasn't it? I, do, do you think this is a story that interests only journalists in that the well, I might have said so. ordinary I mean, public and we're talking about it. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but, but by and large the American public is a baffled by it and, and it is almost irrelevant to any ordinary person's life. Well they may be baffled by it, but I'm not sure it's irrelevant. I mean really this goes to the heart of whether or not the Bush administration was attempting to skew the they light of their way to the war. Yeah. I think it's fairly central. I mean, I think it's it's a pretty interesting. Set. Hey, we will take a, we will take a wager, but I'll, I'll let me not monopolize questions. An actual student, I believe. Okay. Um, you know, you're, it sounds like you're going to newspapers and selling this idea, and we're all. I mean, people who are involved in the industry are gung ho and ready for change. I think, but how are you selling the ideas to nonprofits, or are you? Yeah. Well, I. Uh, again, I, went, I had this. Uh, Geneva, let me just repeat the question. You know, oh. that says repeat the question. Oh, sure. So, how are you selling the idea of nonprofits getting more involved in the enterprise of journalism to nonprofits? Well, um, that's an interesting question. I haven't been assertively selling it anywhere. I've sort of been taking invitations <coughs> I get. But I found when I spoke at a, at a New York dinner. Um, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences was the sponsor, and Barton Gregorian, who's the head of the Carnegie Corporation, which is a big foundation, um, is, is the person who came up and said, you know, we could do this, we could do that, we should fund investigative reporting chairs. 
And I, and I speak about it, obviously, on these, I'm on a number of nonprofit boards, and when I go and speak to funders of those boards, I talk about it. And I'm on the Journalism Advisory Committee at the Knight Foundation, which actually does an incredible amount of work on behalf of journalism and on behalf of journalism innovation. But I would love to think about how I could do it more. I'll tell you a really, an example that I think is very interesting. If I could take just a minute here, and it goes to your good question. Um, and again, I'm going to stand up. There, I, I was part of a discussion recently in Memphis at the Media Reform Convention, which I'd love to talk about if it becomes relevant. But before the convention, there was a gathering of mainstream media folks. And we were talking about what, what are there new forms of media ownership models that we could help foster. And one fellow was there. And a fellow named Jim Schaefer, who's a former chief financial officer at the Los Angeles Times, and he's now dean of the business school at the University of Maine in Portland, Maine. And he's part of a civic group. I've forgotten the name, but it's a bunch of people who care about Portland and who have money and who care about social capital and, and who understand that journalism is a form of social capital. And the paper there is owned by the Blethyn family, who also own the Seattle Times. <coughs> who are losing their shirts in Seattle, a very noblesse oblige kind of family ownership. And there keep being ru rumors that the Blethyn family will sell to Portland. I'm not carrying those rumors. They are not saying they're going to, but Jim Schaefer was saying there keep being these rumors that the Bleth Blethyn family will sell to Portland paper. And Jim was saying, you know, I ought to get this group kind of thinking about this and approach the Blethyns and say, if you ever do want to sell, we would very much like to gather the resources to buy the paper and run it as a public trust. I mean, it would produce enough money to, to continue, and we would run it as a public trust. Well, a few of these examples exist, like the St. Pete Times, but not many. But I mean, that would be a great way for people who care. You know, it's not a foundation, but it would be a group of people who would be doing it as a public trust. It's a very interesting idea. Of course, that situation doesn't exist in a lot of communities. Gentleman back there. Yeah. Just, just reacting to what you just said. Um, one of the problems with that is the amount of money it takes to buy a paper these days is so extraordinary. I mean, I, I remember, uh, you know, when, when I was, you know, at, at my own paper, that would a bunch of us would fantasize about actually owning the paper, and of course, you can't even fantasize about. I mean, what it, what it was worth then and what it's worth now, you know, it's off the charts. Well, so have you to, have to have a geffen. Well, I have two answers to that, okay. actually. I, I think it's an interesting moment. This is my husband, who it works for McClatchy, just hates it when I say this, because who wants to find a silver lining in selling the Star Tribune to a bunch of private equity investors? But remember, in eight years, that paper went from a billion to 500 million in, in value. I actually think we're going to be seeing papers valued so much less that it will make it more possible for people with a lot of means, but not necessarily Broad or Geffen, yeah. to gather together to get papers. That's the one thing I want to say. The other thing I want to say is that the editor of the Commercial Appeal in Memphis told me that they are making, typically newsrooms, as I said, newspapers make about 80% of their revenue from advertising, and advertising is moving on to the web. And the web revenues are going like this. That's the good news. But the, the old revenues are, are going like this, which is the bad news, and they're way, way up here above. I mean, some people think it'll be 30 years before they meet. And one of the great challenges, now you're running a newsroom, you're trying to do all the old stuff to keep the old 19th century industrial operation the presses and the truck distribution and all this going. And yet, you, and you're not really training people to go online, but you know you've got to go online because those other people are doing all this cool stuff online and the advertisers are going online. Well, what if, Chris Peck said to me, we are making about 5% of our revenue, we, the commercial appeal in Memphis, making about 5 or 6% of our revenue online, but it equals about $8 million. And we could run our newsroom on that. Now, I like to believe most newsrooms are paying more than $8 million. But if you gave me $8 million, I could do some pretty good community news coverage. And so what if you took that $8 million in a given community, and either you jettisoned the 19th century. I know this is a dramatic thing, but we're talking about the life <coughs> of media. 
You either jettisoned the 19th century industrial stuff, or you outsourced it, as long as it was still valuable and you cared deeply, as we should, about the many readers who prefer to read online, like me, I mean, on news hard copy like me. You might outsource. You might outsource the printing and the distribution. But you really turn your attention to the $8 million news gathering um, operation on the web. We, you know, what we need to save is not the existing journalism organizations. What we need to save is news gathering. And I like to believe we will not run all those existing news operations into the ground before somebody saves the news gathering team. But I think we have to start getting imaginative about it. And I think that would be one interesting way to do it, dramatic as it is. Yes? Um, just kind of following on this, uh, there have been some pretty high profile people who've come forward um, about part considering um, finding all the times. And I was wondering. I'm sorry. <coughs> there have been people who've come forward about what? Yeah, buying the other times. Oh, broad and definite. <coughs> Uh -huh. you know, engender interest in that. Well, I've been hopeful in some ways about returning newspapers to local, private ownership. Here, here. And, I, and I think we had some great local, private ownership. But we also have to remember we had some terrible local, private ownership. And what I think, I don't know Geffen or Brog, but I, I worry that people who are buying the newspaper because they really care about their local influence might be models that are worrisome. Even though I, you know, compared to what? Compared to private equity investors who are going to turn it over to somebody else in 12 years? I'd rather go with a Geffen, I think. But I, I don't think we should delude ourselves that that's a gold standard. Because, I don't know, have you all, I, I can't stand Michael Wolf's reporting in Vanity Fair in some ways, but I, he has written a really interesting piece on this exact point that I commend to you in the current issue of Vanity Fair. I've been riding airplanes a lot, what can I say? <laughs> and his contention is these people, first of all, they really don't get it about newspapers. A lot of these people are 70, 75. They are part of a generation, God bless them, who really care about newspapers. And they believe that everybody still wants to read newspapers online. I mean, <laughs> why do I keep saying that? <laughs> Hard copy newspapers. And that, you know, Michael thinks that they just don't, you know, you could argue that Brian Tierney sort of did this in Philadelphia. He thought, oh, look, if I just take it over and run it, I can make it work. And then he's going, oh, my God, what do I do? And he's cutting left and right. Of course, that is partly because the bottom fell out right after he bought it. But I worry that they <coughs> might buy it as a kind of a local, you know, Booster. vanity trip. And, yeah. But I guess my question is, okay. It's the devil or, or the frying pan or whatever. I never get my cliches right. <laughs> but what, you know, I don't know. It might be better than a private equity investor. I don't know what the right combination is going to be. Everybody loves to vilify Dean Singleton, who now owns the yes. San Jose paper. I got to tell you, I know him a little bit. I understand that he's, he's you know, like, he's no god. But I really believe two things about him that are important to remember. One is he, he holds this company privately. And there is a lot to be said for the nimbleness that that gives you. Public newspaper companies have just been unable. I mean, I actually believe Tony Ritter, for all the vilification, wanted to do a lot of the right things, and the shareholders didn't want it. They're saying, no, nope, produce the money. Forget it. They forced the sale. They're trying. Morgan Stanley, which owns 7%, I believe, of New York Times company stock right now, is trying to end the two-tiered voting structure which is really a form of protection, but it is no guaranteed protection of the New York Times. I mean, there is, I don't know what the good thing is, but I know Singleton is privately held, and I know that he cares about his reputation. I mean, I see him at Gridiron in Washington, and he's, you know, he wants people to believe that he, he really cares more um, than just for the money. And he's talking to Yahoo, he, he would be willing to do things with syndicate, with guild, with the guild folks that Tony Ritter wouldn't have had the stomach to do. I mean, none of this is pretty, but nothing that is happening in the newspaper industry right now is, you know, oh, this is the solution, this is working. So I don't know. And gentlemen, thank you. I, I went to a presentation about the Link TV <clears throat> the other day in the city. Link? Peter, Peter, yeah, Link TV. They're reaching 25 million homes. They're doing all kinds of incredible investigative reporting. Episodes about alternative 
sources and energy and, and, and the environment and whatnot. Peter Coyote narrated this. They're getting it's foundation grants and they're reaching 25 million homes. Why? I mean, the question to me is why would anybody, you know, sponsor print journalism when you know you can reach that many people on broadcast, uh, broadcast television on the web? Because newspapers taken as a whole are reaching way more people than that. On any given Sunday, you know, the death of newspapers is greatly exaggerated. Thank you, Mark Twain. On any given Sunday, more people are reading their daily newspapers than are watching the Super Bowl on Super Bowl Sunday. It's not, newspapers are not dead, and they are very important. They're reaching a hell of a lot more households than that. Really, I, I think that is an important fact. That doesn't mean that what Link TV is not, I mean, that's good. Who's, it's foundation support? Check it out. Yeah. yeah. Foundation, uh, L -I -N -K? Maybe, maybe foundation grants, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Megan? Um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get to read your report ahead of time, so I'm not sure if you address this, but how much do you think journalists are a factor in this? Because there have been some really big scandals where journalists have failed, both in you know the coverage of the war, um, either Lion or points with Jason Blair. I mean, it, it seems to me, at least as a journalist in school, that people don't trust the news anymore, either on TV or in print. I mean, how much do you think we are responsible for people not reading this? Absolutely an important question, and there's no question that we in journalism have, you know, not only engendered, but really exacerbated a lot of, a lot of these feelings. And I think it's a complex cause, right? I mean, some of it is about scandals, which are bruited about and should be. Um, some of it is about the very transparency that we're now trying to adapt in order to engender confidence on the part of people. Some of it is about criticism about the media that to some degree is very much justified and to a considerable degree is exaggerated. I mean, I think there's so many elements here. There is so much good journalism and nobody sort of, it's sort of like, you know, when you're editor of a newspaper, you get all these phone calls. The people don't call you when you say, you did a really good job today. They call you when they aren't happy with something or something. And it's the same sort of characterization of journalism. If you ask the average Joe how it's sort of like with Congress people, I believe this is the same, is it not, Susan? You ask them, what do you think about Congress? Oh, terrible, a bunch of scoundrels. What do you think about your congressman? Well, I think he does a pretty good job. That's what people say about their local media. Well, my newspaper in bed, but a media, you know. So I think people do understand that journalism is important to them. We have definitely failed in a number of ways, but when we fail, I mean, I think the New York Times went overboard after the Jason Blair scandal. It was appalling and they needed to deal with it, but they had a double truck yes. inside the newspaper. <laughs> Do they have a double truck when they say, we are now telling you about warrantless wiretapping? I mean, they're doing really important work and we, we sort of okay already. We do to ourselves. We do journalism unto ourselves. We all go overboard, right? Somebody makes a mistake and we pile all over it. Now we're piling all over ourselves, which is better than we used to be. At least we're being transparent. But we, if we're going to do this and say, we, you know, hair, shirt, and all this, we need to also do the other, which is to say, would you know about secret prisons in Europe that you are funding unless Dana Priest at the Washington Post told you? And who, nobody is saying this enough either. So I worry that we, you know, the public hears a lot about the criticism and it doesn't hear nearly enough about, okay, they, were, they weren't so great on the lead up to the war, but look at this stuff. And do you know what it takes to get this stuff? Really difficult. Big, well, <laughs> expensive Well, it's arguably the case that the national media in conjunction with five conservative Supreme Court justices delivered this country over to George Bush and his gang of thieves. Well, I understand about the five Supreme Court justices. I wouldn't have thought the media delivered the country to Bush. I mean, the coverage of Al Gore. Pardon me. The coverage of Al Gore all the way through the campaign. Well, and the coverage of somehow the Al Gore managed to win the election despite it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but by not by enough to allow them to keep them from using Florida to steal the election. I do think there were terrible uh, and they're errors doing it right now. Well. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, they're doing it to whom? There are all these candidates. I think there will be a lot of cynical coverage, and I think it is undermining. That's true. I doubt that it will be as imbalanced. I think we'll see, we'll see more. I think the media are in a different place. I think the media are creatures of the society, and the society after 9-11 has been a different, not that that was before the election, but 
I mean, the truth is, I don't, I don't know that I fundamentally disagree with you, but I blame the Supreme Court more than the press. Let's get another <laughs> student over here. Um, I wanted to ask you. I've worked in nonprofit um, places before, and my concern with your with your system or your idea is, um, is, is, is sorry, is concerning. Um, I mean, we're paying as students, we're paying a lot of money to get our masters here, and <laughs> I hope someday that I'll be able to pay off that debt. Um, so, and, and having worked in nonprofit, that's not something I really consider that feasible. Um, so, how do you how do you marry Journalists making a living wage and getting paid for what they're doing with nonprofits running newspapers. How do I marry journalists making a living wage with nonprofits running newspapers? Well, journalism have been, <clears throat> has never been well paid, even when it was a corporate cesspool, as they said at this media reform conference. Um, but I actually believe that if you are doing what I bet you're doing here in this fine graduate program, and that is equipping yourself to be multifaceted in this journalism world so that you can go forth into a newsroom, whatever the newsroom looks like, and, de and deliver news that has all the good journalism standards, but that is, you know, across platforms, and that you do that with enthusiasm, you will be gold. Newsrooms are dying for those skills. And so I, I don't think you'll have any trouble. You'll never make, well, I shouldn't say you'll never if you get to be editor, you'll make more money than you ever imagined you'd make, but you aren't going to get rich doing it, but you'll have a great career, and you'll be adequately paid. So I, don't, I mean, I think you'll be hired, and you'll, you'll do decently. I'm just wondering if it would get worse with a nonprofit. Well, <clears throat> again, when I say non, I mean, nonprofits were one of my nine propositions. We may have stressed it too much, and I'm not saying, I think that the number, I mean, the media in this country are fundamentally corporate media, and I think we have to acknowledge that and care about what happens there. And I assume that we'll get to a place where we figure out the advertising online better than we have now. And most media will continue to be corporate media, and some will be privately held, and some will be in, owned by you know, private equity investors, and some may be taken over by benevolent local rich folks, you know, who knows. But I don't think most of them will be run by nonprofits. But I think most of them will be worrying about where the profit comes from. The halcyon days that we knew about. But you know, when, the, when they were making all this money and behaving like cash cows, which as somebody said, is, that is a strategy. And that is what they were doing. The reporters weren't making a lot of money. I mean, shareholders were doing real well, but reporters weren't making a lot of money. So the halcyon days weren't so good for reporters either. This one. Back there. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I actually have another question, but this makes me want to ask you a, ask a second question, so we may ask you too. AP is nonprofit, so if you could comment on that model, and AP reporters do pretty well, give, you know, in the industry. So if you could comment on that. But my original question was if you would talk about the highlights of the uh, conference in Knoxville. And let me Memphis. actually just repeat both of those for sure. the for the cameras. The first is about uh, the AP model. AP is a nonprofit. And then the second, highlights of the conference in Knoxville. Well, I wish I understood more fully what people think about AP's future. The Associated Press is really a, a membership organization. And it is funded because the newspaper members and radio members, all media members, pay for the collective information gathering, which is terribly important. You talk about a lifeblood for our media, as you know. And Tom Curley, the current CEO, has been very inventive. And I believe, he also, by the way, has been one of the main reasons we're speaking out on behalf of freedom of the press in Washington. I'm very impressed with his, his assertiveness in that regard. A lot of people think the AP is being so creative, and I, I wish, I'm sure there are people in this room who know more about it, that its future is going to be gold, and other people think it's just going to sink like a stone because it really relies on the fortunes of its members. But you're exactly right, it's a nonprofit. In that regard, it's very interesting. Um, very interesting period. His biggest customer right now is Yahoo. And what, I mean, that, that's part of where I don't quite understand. Some people think that it's, that Yahoo is not paying what it ought to be paying, right? And negotiating these contracts with new media people is going to be critical. And I don't know, people in this room probably know more about that. Who, who might educate us about that? I'm ready to be educated. <laughs> I'm hungry to be educated. Well, let me give it a try. I wish you would. Um, <laughs> and I tried this with because 15 years ago, um, 
the person you're looking at right now and who we've all come to see, was staring down at me from that glass window at the morning register when I was just a, a pup intern there, uh, back from my day to the J School in Nebraska. Is that right? I'll be. Michael Ho. I'll be damned. Well, isn't that cool? I appreciate um, you saying that. I can shed some light on that in a couple of ways. Um, all the new media people are all going to tell you that content is king. And that was going to be the basis of my question, mm -hmm. is we spend a lot of time and a lot of Freudian slips as newsprint versus online. How do people really want to receive the content? What we're losing sight of is how do we get the content? And how do we make sure these quality graduates that we're putting out today choose that path and are properly paid for it at, at a level that lets them take their own path? Because I was faced with that choice, and I left the business. And I do something different now. I'm not a journalist. How do we make sure that people want journalism as a vocation, as something that will pay them a wage that they consider well, I thought you were going to tell us about the AP. <laughs> I, but, but the question about, I mean, now I have two questions. I want to answer your Memphis one, too. I don't think our main problem is making sure young people want to do journalism. I mean, if we're doing good journalism and people need journalism and people, you know, there, there are plenty of talented people doing good journalism. I, I don't, I mean, at least in Missouri, I, I can't believe the talent that still wants to go into journalism. There are too many people wanting to do good journalism for the companies that are making money doing the journalism. So uh, maybe I don't get it, but I mean, I don't think that's our main problem. Um, but I still want someone to help me with the AP thing. But if we don't do that, then I want to go to the Memphis Reform Convention. I, I don't know if you all know about the Reform Convention. But Memphis, not Knoxville. Yeah, Memphis. Yeah, I heard Bill Moyer. Wow. I mean, we're talking 3,000 people, Bill Moyers, Danny Glover, Gina Davis, Jane Fonda, I mean, Jesse Jackson. This is an event. And mainstream media, which is what I am, don't go to this. See, that's one thing you need to know. This was the third one, and we all know there's sort of Bob McChesney out there doing some lefty progressive things, but editors like... My sort of, we don't do this. But I mean, I'm doing this manifesto, and I really want to know what's going on in the journalism world. And so I went. And I am telling you, this is a phenomenon, and everybody in journalism ought to understand it. And it's not all one kind of people. I mean, I had people coming up to me like this. I really appreciate your saying we used to work together. You know, this wonderful woman came up to me and said, You know, I live in Clear Lake, Iowa, and I remember when you were editor of the Des Moines Register. So, I mean, it was a great, an astonishing gathering and all this energy. But these people, they actually say things like the cesspool of corporate media. And I don't mean to say they actually, but the fact is the whole conference was dominated by this assumption that nothing the mainstream media are doing is worthwhile. Now, I understand when you want to rouse people to get excited that you say things like that, but it's not the best way to move forward. And so when I moderated a panel that they, they asked me to do this, and Helen Thomas was on the panel, she's kind of an unwitting heroine of this movement. It's really interesting to see her there because she's kind of amazed that she's, such, she's an unwitting heroine because she's so willing to criticize and question the White House. But, but she, well, she was also amazed at the questions. And then they'd say things like, well, why, don't, you know, why doesn't media ever do this and that? And she'd go, well, the media do that. You know? <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting thing. But I can't, you know, I, I had my eyes opened to how important it is that we join forces with people who want media reform, at least some of us, um, media and the public interest. Because if I fault them for saying things like cesspool of corporate media, I fault the mainstream media for not even knowing what's going on. I mean, I came back and read Romanesco, and you all know most of you Romanesco, it's kind of the Bible of media gossip. And at least for the first several days, there wasn't a single mention. I could read all about Donald Trump and his comb over and whether Rosie O'Donnell is fat and all this. And I couldn't read a damn thing about 3,000 people in Memphis who really are trying to get better media. So I, I think, you know, what that was it. I'm sorry? What is Oh, I'm sorry. R-O-M-E-N-E-S-K-O. -E -E if you go to the Pointer Institute, P-O-Y-N-T-E-R dot org, the Pointer Institute, which owns the St. Pete Times and is continuing education for journalists, 
they, <clears throat> on their site, they have this thing we call Romanesco because Jim Romanesco does this. He's this, he's a great guy, he's this sort of mole-like guy, you know, who just reports gathers on news the media on the news. Of course, you can also go to the Graduate School of Journalism website and find a link there <laughs> as well. Oh, so. Um, there was somebody, the students here, I want to get as many of the students in as I can. Somebody who hasn't asked a uh, student question, is there somebody? Oh, that's right. Oh, all right, Dave. Um, all this seems, as you've admitted, very centered on mainstream media. But I wonder, okay, so let's assume that mainstream media maybe will lose a little of its power and influence. And how do you think that what is emerging, which is a pretty vast network of smaller niche and local publications working online and in paper, will be able to do the job, and especially given the net, I mean, stories move very quickly, so if there's an important story that pops up here, that the whole country can very well know about it by the end of the day, even if it was reported by uh, an obscure location. So I just wonder what you, how do you see the future of a, of a wider network of smaller publications? Well, your question is so interesting. Um, can know about it. Uh, what, uh, first of all, I agree, and in fact, what, the way I feel is not as focused on mainstream media as I think my remarks have sounded. In fact, when I'm in the San Francisco Chronicle newsroom, they're kind of look at me and going, you know, why, why are you so excited about all these things that are happening? So, I think it's important to stress more than we have here how many great things in the public interest are happening online. And, and you know, Larry Jenks, who many of you may know, who's on the board of the McClatchy Corporation and a longtime Knight Ritter executive, and I were talking about this yesterday. And he said, You know, if you ask me, am I, maybe I already said this, I'm sorry, uh, am I optimistic about journalism? I'd say yes, because of exactly what you're talking about. Am I optimistic about the continuing existence of current journalistic operations? I'd say no. Now, but here's, what I, but here's where I take issue with your question. You said, So maybe they'll lose a little influence. I think it's much bigger than that, and I think it should matter to you and it should matter to me. I think the bottom is dropping out of the economic model. So it's not losing a little influence. I mean, I think, you know, when the Boston Globe yesterday withdrew its last few <coughs> overseas correspondents. Now, I love Global Voices Online, and that's a bunch of bloggers who are actually bringing us a lot of stuff. But I, I, even as I say to everybody, let's recognize this golden world out here that's developing. I also say we need to recognize that if we have fewer professional eyes trained on countries overseas, then that's fewer eyes. You know, I worry about what's happening in Washington. People say, well, there will always be the New York Times, and there will be the Washington Post, thanks to capital testing company, there will be. But fewer eyes on Congress. That should worry us. Fewer smart eyes on Congress. If I can exercise moderator's prerogative in the middle of this, I, I want you to go back to your point about do you have well, to have critical mass, big size, well, to that's, monitor that's big actually where, where I was going. I was like, so we lose a little power. And, and well, how many people really can go up against a federal government now that is doing everything in its power? to operate secretly, to take unto itself more power. I mean, it's hard to go up against that kind of thing. And can individuals do it? I hope so, frankly. I hope we'll find ways to empower. I was hearing something interesting at Stanford yesterday. There's a professor there whose name I'm not sure I'll recall, who's working on how to gather bloggers together so that they do have kind of a power of consortium. I don't mean that would supplant this, but I mean, in other words, I can't say I don't think we can find some models, but I don't think we can be as blithe as so mainstream media loses a little power. It's been imperfect for sure, but it's critical to our democracy that there be this powerful journalism against powerful government and powerful business. But you were going to say something more to that. Well, you said there are fewer eyes maybe trained on Washington now. I, I just wonder if that's really the case. I mean, there are so many smaller publications that maybe most of the people in this room haven't even heard of and I haven't heard of, but there are people covering it. Okay, but I, let's, let me think about the difference, I mean, maybe you can help me on this one, but I think it's very critical to think about the difference between journalistic inputs and outputs. And I think Michael Powell of the Federal Communications Commission made this mistake. He said, remember when he was talking about cross-ownership rules changes, he said, we shouldn't worry about all that. We can, there is a great proliferation of media outputs, outlets, and that's true. But there is not a great proliferation of input. 
when it comes to the expensive and difficult thing of gathering local information, gathering investigative reporting. I mean, this is actually hard to do. And every guy sitting there, or every woman sitting there, you know, chewing over. Some people, are, a lot of people, are chewing over the original information. A lot of these small people in Washington are saying very interesting things, actually, and are doing very important work to question the power of mainstream media. I think it's one of the best things that have happened. But are they really finding out what happened in, in back rooms at the Capitol and really finding out what happened in the White House when it's hard for mainstream media to do it? And they don't do it well, but I don't think many of these folks are doing it. Let me get somebody who hasn't asked a question back there. Hi, I just wanted to point out the business model of the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party and the And it's been a real effective gadfly, I know. Yeah. Yeah, they, they do their best, I think. And they've been doing that for 40 years, and hopefully 40 years in the future, too. And Actually, a lot of alternative media, a lot of ethnic media, a lot of weekly newspapers are thriving on models just like this small business models. Yeah, and they recently intervened in the first media news merger um, case that's going down here, and a court order came down yesterday. Um, a bunch of documents have been sealed, 90 boxes worth, um, and there is some suspicion that uh, there were documents about collusion, collusion with advertising already before the merger has even happened. And this is advertising that would benefit these newspapers and make it all cheaper to run them and cut back staff. And, um, so the order yesterday was that all of the documents have to be unsealed except for two. And the Guardian will be covering exactly what's in Very cool. They've only been making that fight for the last 30 years. <laughs> Tenacity is a virtue. Is there somebody who hasn't had one, and then I'll come back to those who have. Yeah, go ahead. What do you think about the concept of sort of, I mean, I know you talk a little bit about professionalization of journalism in this document. What, what do you think about the concept of sort of a not a union of journalists, but like an organization of independent journalists that, that the public feels that they can trust because they've been somehow or organized. The question is about an independent organization of journalists. Yeah, and the, and the first part of the question was about kind of credentialing and professionalization. I think these are two very important arenas. And, and again, there's something that if you say this to most journalists, they go, oh, oh, oh you know, we don't lobby, we aren't licensed, we don't. We don't, you know, join organizations. We're, but let's think about the downsides of some of these things that have been such a part of our culture. You know, there are plenty of countries where people do. I mean, there are free presses in Western Europe where people have very strong organizations that are national. The fact that we don't have one organization that can speak out on behalf of journalism has actually been weakening for us. Now, I don't think we're going to have it. I spent a long time. <laughs> so much of what I've written about here, I've wasted, you know, this month, six months on that, six months, I don't waste. But I cared so much about these, how do we build boards that care about journalism? And, now, you know, now they're not making money anymore, so what they're going to, you know, what just. Well, this one I sp spent a lot of time on. And one thing I hoped for was that the Council of National Journalism Organizations would at least bring together all these you know, there's a plethora of journalism organizations. It's all fractionalized. And so you've got not only all the different jobs in the newsroom have their own organization, feature editors, copy editors. You've also got all the different ethnic groups. And you've got all, you know, you've got SPJ for students. And you've got the American, you've got all the levels in the newsroom, the ASNE and APME. So you have this huge, so what if we brought all of them together, and, which existed already, but all they ever did was exchange dates of their conventions. What if you brought them together and said, okay, but are there a few basic things you could agree on you might want to speak out on when journalists are jailed or something like that? It's almost impossible. So that, you know, I kind of gave up on that one. But I think we ought to think about that and, and the loss of that. I also actually believe we ought to think about credentialing. And I know it's just another thing. I mean, my editor who put this together said, you don't want to really talk about credentialing, do you? Well, I do. I want us to think about it. Because we have to separate, I mean, we have to think about what does professional journalism, what does it mean? It would be good for us to think about that. I don't want licensing. 
But I think if we thought about ways that we would show that people had a certain corpus of knowledge, it could be useful to us. Phil Meyer, who's one of the most interesting thinkers, I think, in journalism, is at the University of North Carolina. He's been long in the craft, and also he's uh, long in, in academia. And he went to the American Copy Editors Society and said, why don't we have master copy editors? Why don't we have, you know, we used to be an apprentice, in, I mean, a craft in the best sense of the word, and we really did have masters in the newsroom who taught. But that was part of the union, was it not? Well, I think part of it was that we, we had better staff newsrooms and we didn't buy off all the old guys. Now we buy them off and they're gone before they can teach. And we just don't really continue to do it. And, it's a loss. T t lack of training is the number one complaint about journalism. I would bet it's Michael, right? That that is one of the main reasons people are unhappy doing journalism, because they don't get trained. They just get worn out. Well, why don't we think about that? I mean, who knows? I, I, I'm not ready for licensing, but I think there are interesting things to think about in this. Nick Lemon at Columbia thinks that if we, the MBA in the, in the business world, it's not licensing, but it connotes a body of knowledge that makes a person you know, it's respected in the business world. Well, our masters, with all due respect, I come from a great master's program, too. They don't hold the same sway. But what if they did? What if we weren't so? We, we've accredited every dink master program in the country. What if only master's programs like this one in Missouri and others that are really strong were real accrediting? I don't know, but I mean, I think it's worth thinking about. It's one of those things. We have this whole set of things. We confuse tradition and principle. And we really need to separate them. There are certain things we really ought to be firm as can be on. But we, it's a vanity to have so many traditions. Yeah. I'd like to ask you to return to Memphis for a minute. Cesspool language aside. Cesspool. Yeah, cesspool language aside, um, what were some of the more valid concerns and criticisms that you wish mainstream media folks had been there to hear? Well, you know, wide swaths of the community are undercovered. This audience was so rich. You went in and there were lots of African Americans, there were people of every hue, there were poor people. We have been so guilty, in my opinion, in mainstream media of sort of giving voice to the powerful. I mean, look at op-ed pages, at least in the main newspapers. My lord, what talk about a rut. Fusty windbaggery is what I think it is. <laughs> so these people are going, you know, oh, let's have journalism up from out of the community. And I'm all for that. Um, I think that's the main. But i got to tell you, the other thing, I, I think I said when I was moderating this panel, I said, this is, I, I haven't been this excited since my 60s activist years. You talk about I mean, one of the great things about being on the Berkeley campus. I was in Boston in those years, but I mean, that was the time, right? So I hadn't been this excited since then. I said, and of course the group, you know, there were 3,000 people that I said. I, I, there were six different concurrent sessions going on, and I had 600 people in the room for mine. I mean, this is a hell of a convention. So I said this thing, and people applauded, and then I said, but I do need to see two, say two other things. And one was about, it's just dumb to say this cesspool of corporate media. Nothing, nothing effective or worthwhile happens in the mainstream media because we really could be allies. But the other one was this. The rich diversity of the audience was not reflected in the panels. So I said, here you are in this reform world, and you suffer from the same illusion the non-reform world suffers from, which is somehow maler and whiter means more interesting, more eloquent, more inventive, smarter. So that's the other thing I said. And I, you know, I wasn't all that impressed with them. But generally speaking, the main thing I think I take away, and I bet all of you would, almost all of you, is people are thinking, well, and this goes back to your point. People are doing journalism. They are doing their own journalism, and they're serving their communities. And these people, they're talking about community radio. And, and what I think is if we could link that with ways also to think about how to have continued effective big journalism, I mean, I think that's anathema there almost to think about that. And I just think. Maybe I don't quite get where they really believe the solutions are, but I have a hard time thinking that, that they really would feel great if all big media, corporate cesspool media, disappeared. Lady over here, and then we'll come back this way. Great. I'd like to actually feel on this conversation. There's, oh, a, there's a bunch of us in the East Bay, and I'd like to think that there are a lot of local organizations like this all around the country that are very, very active politically. We call ourselves the Boston Democratic Club. And one of the things that we noticed when we had taken on that early phase of, oh my God, he's going to cut out 
Social Security. We decided that, well, what if we had a system where all of us, I mean, let's say if you're an attorney or something like that, people had a tag team with journalists. What if we adopted, you know, tag team like, 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 like basketball or something, you know, where anything that we learn, we pass on to our trusted journalists. Because you were talking about the huge cost, the huge expense right. of the originating <clears throat> investigative journalist. Right. And what if all of us, you know, had a process of forwarding that so that you had rich, you know, pre theoretically right. well vetted stuff right. that you had to work with. And because we feel, my God, we've got this stuff, who can we give it to so that they can pass it on? Mm -hmm. You know, and so that kind of dynamic. Really well, I'm so, so glad you raised that because I know we've got to close, I know, but I'm thrilled that you raised that because that's the single most important thing that we haven't talked about at all, and that is citizen <coughs> journalism, which is absolutely critical in so many ways. First of all, people want, I mean, it's a very democratic thing. That's great. Second, it really is useful for journalism, and, and we've got to be more open. Absolutely, and it's useful for democracy. I think it's so interesting to see what some people are doing about this. And one of the most interesting organizations I know is Minnesota Public Radio, which is doing something called Public Insight Journalism, which is great stuff. And I commend that to you, just Google Public Insight Journalism. And these, what they've done is sort of aggregate people who are among their listeners who have different interests and expertise and they collect the information from them, and then they have made these new positions in the newsroom called analysts, who are journalists by training. And they, they, they sort of accumulate this information and feed it into the journalism process. The aggregation process. I think it's just a great, I mean, it's a great way to do it, because they are calling upon the wisdom of the masses, which is, we're foolish not to call upon. But so many organizations that are doing that are doing it in a kind of, well, we'll let the masses have their say, and they sort of corral it over here where people can blab, you know, a sort of cacophony of voices. I'm afraid that's part of what's happening. And, okay, I'm going online. I get that people want a seminar, not a lecture, so I've got to let people talk. So they do it over here. You know, here are the citizen journalists. If you really want to listen to them, go over there. That's not what you mean, and it's not what democracy needs. I think Minnesota Public Radio is doing a really good example of that, and I know there are many others, but it's, you're exactly right. <laughs> people have all this expertise. We've got to tap it. It's a very hopeful and element. And also did cuts down on the incredible Absolutely. Absolutely. So you see, we do have a hopeful note to end on. <laughs> Excellent. All right, I want to thank Geneva World for very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. How long are you going to be in the Bay Area? Are you Just on your way back? Shay Panise and I, and I'm doing a radio thing here tomorrow, and then I'm flying to Salt Lake City to see my dog. So, all right. Well, we hope you will be back soon. I'd love to come back. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you all. Thank you. And thank you again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.